Hello and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast. My name is Delton and I'll be your host today. And with me is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Hello, hello, hello. I'm the yellow player, Alan. Not you. I am the yellow player. Haley is almost always the yellow player unless we play with someone like Alan who usually takes it. But it doesn't happen too often, which is fine. We are the Malthouse Games Podcast. We talk about board games, card games, role-playing games. Uh, all the kinds of tabletop games and beer, of course. What do we have to drink today, sweetie? We're going to dive into the beer first because that's just how we're going to do it today. We're also only going to have one beer because this one is quite a bit higher in alcohol percentage and we have stuff to do after this, like go see Jen Wynn and Cody. We're going to go see some friends and probably have a few more drinks, and so we wanted to be a little light on the beer today. And we also had some drinks last night because it was Haley's birthday yesterday. Insert finger dance time. Woo! Okay. Uh, yes, it was Haley's birthday. She turned 28 on Friday the 29th. Happy birthday, even though this will be two days after. It's okay. Every day is my birthday in my book. That's horrible for me, though. <laughs> the beer today is from Prairie Artisan Ales. They are a local Oklahoma company. This is their seasick crocodile. It is a sour ale with cranberries, ginger, cinnamon, and nutmeg. It comes in at 6.3% alcohol by volume. Is this making us to be cannibals because we are drinking ginger? I think so, but on the cover it's got like reindeer and Christmas stuff, and then it has an alligator chasing Santa down. But it looks like a Christmas sweater. It looks like a Christmas sweater style. Absolutely adorable. We're going to try it out. I'm unsure because I don't like cranberries, but we'll see. This is fitting because we just went to Goodwill and Big Lots and bought a cubic F-ton of Christmas decorations. So we've been in our house for five years now and never truly decorated for Christmas because we don't own Christmas decorations. Like that's not something we ever invested in. And we were broke for basically the first six years of our relationship. And so we never really had the chance to until now. And so we decided, you know what, let's get some Christmas decorations and make the house feel a little more homey during the holidays because we both like that feeling. Plus, we're still broke, but we're less broke, so we got them at Goodwill. We got them at Goodwill and Big Lots, so we did not spend much money on these. And we could have gotten a significantly larger amount of decorations, but we held back restraint. But we got some cute pillars, and we got us some cute snowmans, and we got us some cute garland, and we got us some cute other stuff, too. We got some cute decorations we're excited about. So let's Mm. smell the beer. This smells like... It's got a very heavy cinnamon smell. It smells like the instant packs of apple cider that your mom used to give you as a kid. That's exactly it. Oh my God. It smells just like it. It smells like an apple cider. It smells like, but not like the good apple cider, like the instant mix, which is the nostalgic one. Ooh, it's got some tartness to it from the cranberry, but it's very good. Cinnamony. This is an interesting, interesting beer. Wow. This is Christmas. It has a very, very clean mouthfeel. It comes in a little thick on the back. Uh, There is a bit of an aftertaste. And the tartness keeps making me salivate, and so it's harder to speak, and I keep having to swallow my spit. (laughs) Santa had a baby in our mouth. Gross, but that's exactly it. This is actually a very, very good beer, despite the description being a little wonky. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end the podcast now so we can go drink the rest of this four-pack. I might take some of this with us tonight. No, it's ours. They have it at the liquor store right here by the house. This is no time for Christmas spirit, (laughs) Delton. No time for Christmas spirit. Anyway, this beer's very good. That's Prairie Artisan Ale's Seasick Crocodile. But yes, not only has Haley's birthday happened recently, but we went to BGG Con down in Dallas. We got to do that last week, uh, and it was an absolutely fantastic time. This was my most favorite con I have been to. Because we just played games and hung out with friends the entire time. We got to meet a lot of new people, including some designers we enjoy and stuff like that, and artists, and it was just great. It felt like everyone was just happy and friendly and really didn't have any bad problems. Like, there's, you know, maybe one thing here or there, but it was a great convention, and we had a great time with all our friends. And I totally fangirled over Beth Sobel, the artist, and Elizabeth Hargrave, who did Wingspan. And a little bit over, over Cole Worley, who did Pax Premier Second Edition. I didn't even realize that was Cole Worley when I met him, and I felt like an <laughs> idiot. And he, and I was my friend Gates was like, "Hey, Cole, Haley likes communist games. Do you have any communist game suggestions?" And he suggested a couple. And I was going about my merry way. Delton's like, "Yeah, it's really cool. You got to meet Cole Worley." 
And I was like, well, who is he? And he goes, well, Pax from here. I was like, son of a buck. Yep, Haley just completely missed that it's that Cole. But I found the games that he suggested in the bazaar, and we ended up buying six games for 100 bucks, which was nice. And so I got to go find him in the bazaar, like, dee 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 Hey, just so you know, I did make the connection that you were the Pax Premier guy, and I'm a huge fan. I'm going to fangirl right now. Also, I bought your game suggestions. Yeah, Gates found one of them for us, and then yes. Haley found the other. She found 1989, and I found... Kremlin. Kremlin, that's right. So I'm excited to play those. And we got to try out uh, some new games. I know before we've spoken about a prototype from Isaac Vega and Plaid Hat, and we got to play that again. And my goodness, I'm so excited for when that comes out. I wish we could say literally anything else about it, but it's, it's, I think it's going to be a hit. I think so, too. It's very good. This is my third time to play, Haley's second time to play, and it's just developed and become more and more advanced in terms of production quality and smoothness, and it's just going to be so good. So we got to see Isaac again. We got, I got to meet Beth. Yeah, Beth Sobel. And we got to meet Elizabeth Hargrave. And mm-hmm. then we also got to see our friend Tyler and play his prototypes. He's really kicking butt with one of his. I'm excited for him to get it polished up and hopefully presented to somebody. Oh, definitely. I always have a good time playing games with Tyler, but seeing his game change from the last time we played it in May, that was awesome to see because it feels like it has gotten better. Yes. And so it's exciting to see that go forward. I'm ready to play that one again, too. And I also got to meet Elijah for the first time. Yeah, I hung out with Elijah at Gen Con because I demoed for Tuesday night, and so did he. Well, he was there staying in the room along with me and Haley and Alan. Uh, and from so, Tuesday night. From like, Tuesday night. Like Elijah and uh, Alan are from the Tuesday night podcast. And yep. then Tyler, he was volunteering with Stronghold Games, but he edits rule books for Portal Games now. Yes, officially. officially. Which is, congrats, Tyler, because it's super Tyler. exciting. Also, thank you again for giving Haley D. Mocker. Yes, you're a very good friend. And we also got to see Gates, and she's awesome as always. Gates Dowd, who does marketing for later games. We got to see a ton of people. Yes, it was very, it was wonderful just to meet up with everybody and mm-hmm. actually have a con where we just literally sat and played board games and then we ate. We, we ate played a board lot. Games. We had a whole meal where there's like 11 of us in Spiral Diner down uh, out, just outside of downtown Dallas. And we just had a big meal and everyone was passing plates around and stuff and It was awesome. Just the whole convention was great. We highly recommend going to BGG Con. Last year, I know I spoke about it, that I didn't have the greatest time because Haley wasn't with me. And for the first day, I didn't know anybody that was there. This year was very, very different because I knew people everywhere. And it made it feel like I always had a connection to somebody. And it really made the con that much better. And then we got to play in the pitch car tournament again, which was a lot of fun. And we met some cool people in there that follow us and we follow them now on social media. And it was just a good time. Plus I came in very last in the pitch car tournament. I was the absolute last person in the entire tournament. I made it to the semifinals, but did not progress past that. I was very proud of myself for that. But it was a great convention. We had a great time with all our friends. If you have the chance to go to any convention, we really recommend BGG Con. Yes, if you want to go somewhere and just play games, BGG Con's definitely the place to go. It's a smaller crowd. I think that they just get close to 3,000 people or just over. The new hotel, which is different than last year, is absolutely fantastic. It's huge. It's nice. It's clean. It's a little more upscale. It's right downtown, so you're a few blocks from restaurant choices. You can walk. You can Postmates. They Postmate beer, which is fantastic. You can Postmate beer in Texas. I repeat, you can Postmate (laughs) beer in Texas. Oh, my God, this changed my life. It was amazing. I just sat there on my phone, and I ordered some local beer, and within 20 minutes, they called me and said, hey, we're in the lobby of your hotel, and it was cold, and we just popped it open and drank it, and it was $11, which is sure the hell beats $8 per beer at the bar. It really does, because that bar was expensive. But, yes, if you want to go to a convention, and you don't know that you want to do the hustle and bustle of Gen Con, or something even as big as Origins, which is like 25000 or so, uh, BGG Con is what we recommend at this point, because it's just been absolutely fantastic, and we had a great time and saw friends. Like I said, I just there's not much more I can say about it. It was just a really good con. And we saw Tom Vassell without a fedora. Without a fedora. It was a normal ball cap. Still a hat, but a ball cap. It was so strange. It was fine. So, speaking of BGG Con, we're actually going to be talking about a game today that we picked up at the con. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's... It's a game. So the game for today, we played the original Japanese version of the game that luckily had printed out English rules, uh, like a translation. Uh, We are playing the TMG 
version that they put out in the U.S. It's full English. Uh, they did change one rule, which I will discuss. Uh, I We keep it the old Japanese way, and they mention that in the game. But the game is Festival of a Thousand Cats. It's from TMG. The game designer is Fukutaro. The illustrations are Satsuki Nakayama. The English translation was done by Dan Kobayashi. Uh, editing and layout for the English is Wood Games Designer website. Uh, additional graphic design by Jody Henning. And it looks like you can go to Wood's uh, thewoodgames.com, or it's also through TMG. So Festival of a Thousand Cats is a small card game. It's only three to four players. I wish it was two players or had a two-player variant because I really enjoy the game. Uh, however, three to four players, it definitely plays super well. I think four is the best, but three is really good. The rulebook actually has just a small change for three players. But the way the game is going to function is there is a deck of cards that are all cats in cute different... Uh, settings. One of them is in a hot spring with like a towel on his head. And in another card, he's in the hot spring eating sushi and he's drunk off some sake and there's a rubber ducky floating next to him. We need to post some of these pictures on the podcast. They're so adorable. Just this to see. We can't describe just how adorable these are. The cards are adorable. I was very happy to see that the artwork stayed the same from the Japanese version to this version. I just want to insert here that my only goal for BGGCon was to play as many communist and cat games as possible. And I did fulfill my goal. She really did. So in Festival of a Thousand Cats, there is the cute cat cards in this deck. The deck is made up of four different suits, which are basically seasons. So you have spring, summer, fall, and winter. And they're all adorable. Like the spring cat is like a kitty who's dancing. And the winter cat is the one who's in the bath. And the summer cat is one that's in the rain, and the fall cat is like an old granny that cooks for you, and it's wonderful. It's really, really adorable. You oh. should look up the artwork to this game. Oh, it's so perfect. That's what drew me to the game at first, also because my, my goal was communist and cat games. I mean, it makes sense. So the way the game is going to be played is very simple. There are a couple different things that you need to know, which is on these cards, there are those four different suits, which are the four seasons. They each have a different color, but I won't worry about the color right now. The Cards are able to gain you points via fish, which are notated on the left side of the card. So on your turn, you're going to pick a card from your hand, you'll play it, and then you're either going to get to keep that card or swap it out with another. I'll explain how that works. Whoever uh, gets to the point cap first wins the game. Most likely it's going to take you several hands. That's how they recommend it. First one to 30 points is their normal. First one to 20 for a starter game. Now, Whenever you keep those cards, there are a few things that can happen. If there's fish, they're worth a point per fish. If there is alcohol in the cards that you've kept, then you get two points per alcohol, unless you have three alcohol or more, which would not only notate the end of a round when someone takes their third alcohol token, but you lose half your fish points from that third alcohol. Basically, because you threw it up, you drank too much and you threw it up, and so you threw up your fish. I also like that it signifies the end of a round because, like, oh, someone got too drunk, party's over. Yeah, I love it's really that. great. It's, it's really great. Adorable. There's also a crow icon that allows you to swap out for the most powerful cards in the game. So, what makes a card powerful and how do you get them? What I enjoy about this game is that you're not just playing a card from your hand and keeping points, it's not a drafting game, it's not sushi go. What it is, is on the middle of the table, after you deal and shuffle everything out, uh, in the middle of the table, there are two cards from the deck that are face up. Those cards are can be anything. So let's say there's a fall card which and a spring card. The players can play any card from any season except fall or spring. Now, as I said, all of these have an icon that notates what it is and a color that notates what it is. So and a cat. People with color blindness or any kind of issues with that will have a e pretty easy time differentiating between these suits yeah because like spring has one single cat fall has one single cat so on and so forth even though the cats are in different positions it's and the icons cat. in the top left too yes so there's multiple things about it uh but what it is is there's two cards up in the middle of the table and every player will play a card that is not of those same two suits so in this scenario if i remember correctly not spring and not winter now you Everybody picks a card and puts it face down, and then they all flip to reveal simultaneously when it's uh, time, when everybody's ready. The person who played the highest valued card, they have values ranging anywhere from 1 to 12. Some suits, like the spring suit, goes, I think, 1 to 9 or 1 to 10. 
and then the fall suit goes like three to thirteen or, or sorry three to twelve. So they are different, but whoever played the highest value card will actually swap their card they played with one of the two cards face up in the middle of the table, the one that has the highest value. The person that played the lowest value will swap for the lowest value card of those two that were in the middle. Everybody else will keep the card that they played and they'll take it. It's called taking a card in the Japanese version. So if this makes any sense, if in the middle of the table there's two face up, they are a spring card value four and a fall card value nine. Whoever has the, or sorry, a winter card value nine. Whoever has the highest value card they played from their hand will take that winter card and swap it for theirs that they played. Whoever had the lowest value will take that uh, spring card and swap it with their card. Then, the, as the next hand goes, whenever the next uh, card everybody plays, you now have to look at these two new cards to see which suits you can't play. It kind of sounds weird, and it's kind of strange to explain at first, but it makes sense. But the thing I like so much about it is you're having to think about, okay, is the card I'm playing worth swapping? Is it too valuable, and I need to try to keep it? And which of these two cards out do I want? Then you have to consider what everyone else is likely going to play. All the cards in the game um, that are played down or taken or up on the table are all uh, open value, or I guess I should say... Um, open knowledge. Open information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the, only the cards in people's hands are hidden. Everything else is information you can see. So you have to think, okay, I think people are going to value this highly. Everyone's going to play a pretty high value card. I should play something because I have a really good card it won't win that one. However, I can win it and get like two fish off of it. So you have to consider what others are playing, but also what cards have been played. And I find that you, you can really not take your time and do very, very poorly. Or if you kind of think a little deeper about everything, it's when you really start noticing the strategy in the game. It's really strange. It's a simple game, but you can apply strategy. But I think that yes. you can introduce a new person to this at the same time. Because we've only played it. Like, what, four or five rounds in total we've played it? I think so. And, like, we already feel like we have a better strategy than the first time we played. And it, but that strategy is a little more complex than just the base game. It definitely is. I just think it's a really, really cute game, and it has a great moral to not drink too much. There'll be that guy, or else the party's over for everyone. And be a cat and get fish. And be a cat and get fish. Now, there are two cards in this game. One is a zero, and one is a 13. They are the highest and lowest value in the game. Basically, insta-wins. They are instant wins for the cards out in the center. However, every single suit has two, I think two cards, maybe one, that have a crow on it. If you play that card that has a crow, and someone else at the same hand then has played the zero or the 13, you get to swap your crow card with theirs, and then you are considered having played that zero or 13 insta win. Uh, another good thing about that is if you take a card only that has a crow, or if you play it and someone sw has to swap with you and they take it, that crow is going to deduct one fish point. So, you, you know, the birds come in and swoop away with your fish. So thematically, it makes sense. Like, this is a game that it really feels like the theme is worked in with the mechanics of the game. Now, oftentimes you play a game and, like, the theme just kind of painted on and da-da-da-da. But this, you really, it really works well with the mechanics. The flavor of the game is perfect. Yes. Yeah, it's, it really is. Everything makes sense thematically. It makes sense for why these icons are the way they are. And the box is small. It also is a small box game. And you could just, I guess if you had a pen and paper, you wouldn't even have to take the box or the tokens you just take the cards just take the cards and it'd be easy enough to travel with but it's a really simple game it's super adorable and cute and we've really enjoyed playing it it's one that i want to play more it does have an advanced version with the score multipliers i haven't approached that at all we've just been playing the base game but we really enjoyed it i thought it was a cute box i wanted to try it it was japanese and i always think that the japanese games are very interesting uh, because it's kind of like oink games which oink i believe is a chinese company if i remember correctly uh, it's just something different. It's things that you usually don't see as often. Yeah. And so I really like trying out these games to Coming see... Coming from a different culture. Exactly. To huh. see what they come up with. And also, like, uh, there's something interesting as an anime and manga fan. The Japanese culture, just the writing and the art styles and stuff is stuff that I enjoy. And so I really like that as well. We really appreciate it. Exactly. But Festival of a Thousand Cats, uh, it's only like a 20 to $25 game. Uh, you can probably get it. I think you can get it cheaper on Amazon, but I always recommend local game store. Of course, if you, yes. if, if they're a friendly local game store, support them. If they're not, I understand, but, <laughs> uh, check it out. It's a really simple game. Three to four players. Will it's like 20, 20 minutes tops. It will fit in a normal size stocking. I think. 
So there you go. That's the game. I hope what I said makes sense. Yeah, I think it did, hun bun. And it's not too complicated. Just go buy it and take our word for it. That's pretty much, that's what I did. I was like, let's try the Japanese version. And then we played it and I was like, okay, I think I'm going to buy this now. <laughs> so we bought it at the TMG booth. Yeah, so I'm really glad that we picked this up with the con. I think that, especially me, my very first con, I was really nervous about playing new things, but it's something I had to learn to get over really quickly. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So since we're trying to keep this episode a little shorter because we have things that we have to go do and... We say that every week and we end up having like an hour long <laughs> podcast of just talking about our cats or our socks. That's, that's pretty true. But the topic for this episode, we wanted to discuss uh, the convention experience basically. What to know going into conventions a bit because... There's a lot of people, uh, like at BGG Con, it was their first time. And I was a first-timer last year. Haley was a first-timer this year. We Woo. had our first times at Gen Con. And we're going to have our first times at, like, Origins and hopefully Shucks one day. So there's lots of things with conventions that you go in not knowing. You can go and find guides online that people write, and that's definitely very helpful. But we thought about giving our perspective a bit, uh, kind of about the con experience. I think my very top like nugget of wisdom, if you want to call it that, is don't be afraid to approach others either to play a game or invite them to your game. Uh, most cons have little stands that you can put up. Let's say you're learning a game and you're by yourself or you need another player. It says players wanted, and people will approach you for that. But it's also okay to approach others. I mean, we all, we all know that lost look where you're standing by yourself kind of surveying a crowd not really knowing where to go we've all been there we all know how that feels as well and you see a lot of that at cons and so don't be afraid to approach a person and be like hey do you want to play this game with us real quick we need a sixth player we need a fifth player because most of the time that person's going to say yes and if worst case scenario they say no i'm looking for my friend all right well, that's fine but we met so many neat people that way at every con we've been to if we needed like a fourth player we need, or Delton and I is playing something that requires three players like a uh, Festival of a Thousand Cats, we can go find somebody easily. There's always going to be people standing around and they want to engage us as much as you do. That's very true. We had a guy come by the table and kind of look at the game. Ryan. and yeah, Ryan and Haley just said, hey, do you want to play? And then he played like two or three games with us and he's a really nice guy. And I saw him later in the con in the game library and I just asked him, what, you know, what did you play recently? You know, what, what have you liked? And this and that. And just had a conversation. But you do meet some very nice people doing that. Now, I will say, Haley has the very easy, I can walk around, talk to people, and make friends. I come from the more uh, social anxiety side, where that kind of situation makes me awkward, I get anxious, or I just want to leave the situation. So, from my perspective of it, it comes down to giving myself something to do and working up to that moment. So, if you're wanting to play a game really badly, you've played it before, let's say you go to the, go to the library, walk around and find something great. You pick it out. You go set up at a table. You could put up a player's wanted sign or before you do, start setting up the game. Thinking about the game, getting all the pieces set up, get the player spot set up, get the cards dealt, the pieces put together and spend that time prepping yourself for, okay, I'm about to interact with random people. For me, that's something I have to do. Kind of like positive it, self-talk. Like I can do this. It, it, it kind of is. But yeah. uh, I mean, it's like even today, I went to Edmund Unplugged to look around at like their Black Friday sales. I sat in the car for 20 minutes. So I was like, I don't really want to go inside alone and like if I get stuck in a conversation. But I just kind of sat there and like thought about, I'm just going to go look at the games. I'm just going to look at games. And then pretty soon I'm like, all right, let's just go look at games. And it's one of those things where, you know, wor working at it helps. And yes, it may not always be perfect, but everybody there is in the, almost the same situation you are. Right. And that is something I realized more this time around in the convention is because we played with so many random strangers or... Uh, you know, somebody invited somebody into the group that we didn't know, and then we play tested their game. And it's just a lot of good stuff, but you can do it, and it's the best environment for this kind of stuff. Right, because everybody's there to engage and play. Yes. I mean, it's not a shopping con. It's a, it's a play con. Even things like Gen Con, there's, you're still going to find people who are just looking to play. You're going to find people who are there by themselves. Like Gates, the first time she went to Gen Con, it was by herself. Yep. And she just made friends, made connections, engaged with people, and was able to have a great time. Exactly. It's just a different experience. So Delton, what's something else that you would recommend? One of the biggest things I would recommend is, and this is always because this is a way to my heart, is food. Ooh, yeah. Any convention you go to, have a plan. Scope out some places. Find out who has Postmates, which ones take Grubhub instead, which ones use Uber Eats, what's in walking distance. 
food is essential because the more food you have in your belly, the less grumpy you'll become because we get grumpy <laughs> Oh man! when we get the rumblies in our tumblies. I do get grumpy. I get like, that's about the only time when I get grumpy is whenever I'm hungry. So my brain shuts off and I'm just like, hmm. Exactly. So food is a big thing. I keep snacks. I try to keep gum. A lot of times we offer them to people because, you know, people enjoy that. And that's even a way to get people at your table. Be like, hey, come down have it. You know, hey, do you want to do you want a beer? I got a nice chest of beer. Like there's all kinds of stuff you can do like that. But food is my biggest thing is eat and stay full. Also, shower. Yes, please. There is no reason why the first day of the con at the pitch card tournament, the con's literally been open for three hours. Somebody smelled like a foot. You need the shower, my friends. I get stinky, too. I'm not like a woman who glistens. No, I sweat, and I sweat a lot. I am a very sweaty human being. But that's why there is deodorant and there are showers. Please use them. And we're in a hotel that has showers attached. So Yes. <laughs> Please take a shower. You might not smell yourself after day three, but by God, all of us do. That is thing, a thing, and we've talked about that before. Hygiene is key. You know, chew gum, have mints. Reapply deodorant. Wash your showered, hands. Wash your hands Don't a lot. Don't get the con cred. Wash your hands. Exactly. But the convention time, it's just fun. It's just playing games and having fun with friends. Going alone is tough. That's the hard one. But if you go with a friend, even just one, it's totally worth it to go and just hang out and have a good time. Yes. And that really leads to, with BGG Con, why we recommend it if you haven't been to a con yet, is because all of the BGG staff are so welcoming to first-timers. Including John. Hi, John. Hi, Anakin OU. (laughs) Because you're the same person. We got to see John at the con. John at the con, which was great. Because we don't see him even though he lives down the road and we need to. (laughs) Yes, we need to meet up with him. But every time Haley saw somebody working, and even people that weren't working, just other attendees, they go, hey, first timer. And then they talk to you. And they make it feel very welcoming. And they make you feel very part of the community. Because they know that this is your first time. Because... A lot of these people, you would see seven-timer, eight-timer, nine-timer on people's badges. There's some people that's been going there since it started. Delton was a two-timer. I was a two-timer. Haley's decision on the wording. (laughs) I thought it was great. (laughs) But it's definitely worth it because BGG Con, if you go to Gen Con and it's your first time, you're just another number. I mean, really? But if you go to BGG Con and it's your first time and you wear the first-timer badge, people do ask you how it's going, ask you what they can change. They ask you your favorite game you've played. And there's been several times, several interactions that I had last year and Haley had this year that really do show they care that you're there. They're happy that you're there and they want you to have a great time. They really did. The BGG staff were phenomenal and welcoming. And I really, even if I didn't have Delton, I feel like I would have belonged. Definitely. Yeah. So now that we have our brief little guide of do's and don'ts of cons, let's move to our question of the episode, Delty Poo. And now... Join us for a Malt House Games podcast special bite size question. So the question for today is going to be a very simple, what is your favorite con memory? So my favorite con memory was at the Boga Retreat, a.k.a. Cabin Con, a.k.a. Alan and friends get together and do some hood rat stuff. We all got together and we played Werewolf in the Dark. I know I've talked about this in previous podcasts, but that was my most favorite con experience I've ever had when he had about 15 to 20 of us in a cabin by ourselves, a big cabin that you know, has a kitchen, has different rooms, and we turn off the lights and somebody plays a werewolf and they go off murdering people and people just die on the ground. And I was a werewolf at one point and I killed Isaac Vega and I felt really bad about that, but I also felt empowered at the same time, except the rest of the night, everyone called me the werewolf, and I kept getting out and being turned into a ghost. But that was my most favorite con experience. We were all engaged in this game for four hours, running around in the dark, terrified and excited, and it was wonderful. That was a very, very good time. That is definitely a highlight of mine. Uh, it's really hard to say what my favorite con moment was, but I always think about how much fun I had. And speaking of BGG Con as a first-timer, Last year when I played the pitch car tournament, I was walking around with no friends, aimlessly, not knowing what to do, and some people were playing a game in the lobby called Bambolio, where there's this big disc balanced on a cork with pieces on it, and you pull them off one at a time, and each one weighs so many grams, and you have to, whoever has the most weight after somebody topples the board over is the winner. Nice and simple. Well, I looked at it, they invited me to play, so I played. Then they said, hey, we're going to the pitch car tournament. And I was like, oh, well, that'd be cool. I've never seen pitch car. They're like, well, there might be some sign-up room on the sheet. So I signed up and went. 
and I had the best time because everyone's laughing. They're having a good time. They're talking. I met a group from Canada that were very kind and gave me a, a Twizzler, and everybody was just so nice. But it was the main moment of last BGG Con where I felt like all these random strangers were just happy to be together playing games. It was my big moment of like realization that this is BGG Con. And so we kind of had the same thing again this year in the pitch cart tournament, but last year's was definitely my big, uh, to me, my biggest, probably best con memory. Yeah, and when we played that this year, I came in last place and even I had a great time. Exactly, and we met a lot of cool people. Yeah, we also met Matt, who is the founder of Bixby Con or BixCon. And he was from Saskatchewan. Is that right? Uh, I think so. Yes, Regina, Saskatchewan. And he was an interesting guy. And we just played the pitch car tournament together, mm -hmm. got to talk. And by the end of it, he gave us a beer from his backpack that was from Canada or something that tastes like a coconut cream pie. And that was just like the ultimate con experience. That is, that is BGG Con right there. You Definitely. get into a tournament, you meet random people. By the end of it, you're good enough friends that you're sharing a beer, adding each other on Facebook and just sharing memories. It was wonderful. It was really good. But I think that's my favorite con experience. And Haley, your favorite con experience is great. Uh, conventions are something we, I think at this point, have to go to. <laughs> we yes. enjoy them. Even though BGG Con's a, per or sorry, uh, BGG Con's the great play experience. Even though Gen Con is a great purchasing experience and all the new hotness, there's still friends that we see there now. And it's, it's fun. It's something to see. It is like going to Walmart on a Black Friday, except it's all board games. So, and there's no fist fights. And there's no, uh, maybe. Well, except for that one time. Except for that one time. But uh, BGG Con, Gen Con, Origins, Shucks, you know, uh, what is it? There's token a Dragon Con. Con. There's Token Con. Can't forget Token Con, there's man. Dice Tower Con. Find one near you, even if it's small, and just go for it. And it's Bix a lot Con. of fun. And we, and, and yeah, BixCon. And we just really recommend the convention experience. But I think that's going to wrap everything up. I will give a shout out to our Patreon backers. Thank you so much, Alan. Allison, Jesse, and Catherine. I'm going to give a special shout out again to Tyler for giving Haley Demacher. Thank you, Tyler. And I'm going to give another shout out actually to our friend Andrew, who sent me some video games through Steam very kindly out of his kind soul. Yes, thank you, Andrew. I'm sorry I'm such a bad Facebooker. I never get on Facebook <laughs> and like I get Delton's like, get on Facebook and look at your messages. And there's this big ass chain of messages between Delton and Andrew that I'm supposed to be taking part in but i'm never on facebook and andrew is so kind and i really like andrew and thank you for the birthday wishes yes thank you for everything so thank you patreon backers if you want to be like them you can go to patreon.com slash malthouse games m-a-l-t-h-a-u-s and stay tuned next time because it's going to be our christmas episode and we will have a giveaway or two is it our christmas episode i think so or is there one before it no, this will be um, the 15th. So this will be the last episode before Christmas. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we might have some giveaway announcements, maybe. We will have some giveaway announcements. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, we got the games for it. That's true. We've got the stuff ready to go. All right. I think that's going to wrap everything up. If you would like to send us a game to talk about, a question to answer on the episode, or any kind of comments or anything like that, contact at malthousegames.com. You can also find us on social media, on pretty much all social media, at Malthouse Games. You can find me personally at Delton Brack, D-E-L-T-O-N-B-R-A-C-K. You can find Haley at... S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-L-Y-G-E-E-K. -E -E that is at Squirrely Geek. If you could also be sure to go onto, if you use an iPhone that's like half a phone users or so, go onto the iTunes store, give us a five-star review because five you star. like us and type out something nice for us. It helps us become more visible and get more views because we want to grow the podcast as much as we can, and it's been growing steadily all year, which has been absolutely phenomenal, and we appreciate all of you for listening. especially All over the world, too. Now that we're in Thanksgiving, we are very thankful for you as listeners because you keep uh, the spark going for us in terms of gaming podcasts. You keep us wanting to come back and record this every two weeks, even though sometimes it's very last minute or sometimes it's so early in the morning. Or so late that we're pushing our time. But thank you guys for interacting with us and really making it fun. For sure. I think that's going to wrap this up. We need to get out of here, grab our friend Danielle, grab a chair, and head to Cody and Jen Wins. Got a drum thrown. So we can have dinner. So until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll talk to you all later. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.